welcome all of you and a special welcome to mr nagarajan um, parodi and ranjani so now it's our third attempt as you all know <laughs> but the first one the, the, the physical meet we couldn't uh, because of the lockdown and then last time we had an unfortunate delay and this time of course we we are uh, Able to host this, we are uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Mutaya up there must be really happy after we are doing it on the Madras Day, which he championed always. And um, Shiram does not require an introduction for a, for a Madras crowd. Nevertheless, since uh, Colors of Glory Foundation has got some outstation members who may not know him that well, I'll just briefly. I mean, he is the best known historian, uh, historian and heritage activist of Chennai. His areas of interest vary from music to architecture and uh, the history, everything about Chennai. I mean, he, he is a, you know, sort of last word on the Madras heritage. Now you have, uh, he is uh, supposed to be an engineer and entrepreneur, but I, as far as I can see, you know, that seemed to be very secondary for him. The main thing is Madras heritage. Um, now, uh, I invite our speaker, Mr. Sriram Olivers, please. Uh, thank you, Captain. And uh, will you be muting everyone else so that uh, I can be heard? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a topic uh, which is uh, which is very difficult for me to uh, personally speak about. Though, so, uh, you know, in the last one week or so, lots of people who uh, came to know that I was going to speak on it uh, told me that surely you don't need any preparation time for uh, speaking on Mr. Mutaya. But uh, I must say that uh, I, it is very difficult to put into words a very great relationship that existed between 1995 and uh, 2019. And uh, he was in every way a mentor, a father confessor, a person who uh, took uh, you know, great pains to mold me in various ways, in ways that I did not even know that he was molding me in. And uh, he was all love and affection and uh, it is it is exceedingly difficult to bring to me uh, bring uh, uh, myself to speak objectively about him. So uh, if you thought that this is going to be a SWOT analysis of Mutaya with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, let me tell you that uh, he never recognized any threats. He was a man with supreme confidence in himself and with a supreme sense of self-actualization. He was very uh, involved in a wide range and at the same time a certain specific set of activity. And outside of that, he cut everything out. He was, for instance, uh, completely out of the world of social media and uh, generally media itself, though he read a lot, he never was interested in pushing himself and getting himself to be recognized or getting himself to be known. Uh, he had no such interest. All the fame that came his way was because of the work that he had put in over several decades and his presentation of that uh, work to a larger public. And so, that was in every way the fact that he, had, he never recognized any threats. Weaknesses, I have no idea. Because I, for me, he was, I always looked upon him with the roseate glasses of a disciple looking at a guru. And so I know that he had a number of strengths. So that is all that I can say about him as a personality. But I will now take you through a presentation of the Muttaya that I knew. At the end of it, I'm sure many of you will come up with several points that I was not even aware of. Certainly, he was a multifaceted personality and these were the facets that I came to know and therefore I'm going to present them to you. I'm going to share my screen and put this up as a slide presentation. Just give me a minute. Uh, 
are you able to see the slide show yes sir uh, are you able yes. to see it mutai yes, yes yes sir yes oh, yes sir thank you thank you very much so uh, the uh, as i said i have just put together a set of slides to basically understand for myself as to who this mr mutai was who was who i mean i was so lucky that he came into my life and uh, he was there for a good two decades and a little more so uh, you know there was a time when ranjita and i decided that mutaya had to write his memoirs he was uh, writing so many other people's life stories that uh, we decided that uh, we must get him to write his life story and uh, we met and met him both of us and said that we will do the writing all you have to do is do the dictating of it and for once he was exceedingly reluctant to tell us the story of his life not because of the fact that he had something to hide but because he said that wildly his wife always thought that uh, you know if somebody began to write their biography that marked the end of a certain life and so she was a little superstitious about it at the same time mr mutaya was very keen that the story of his life should be recorded and so he said wali need not know but you people can come and meet me and i will generally start telling you all about myself he even said if i remember very correctly and ranjita will will i mean i'm open to correction by ranjita he said let's not begin on a tuesday and i told him i didn't know that you believe in all this he said no no but i have been well trained by my wife in these matters so we began on a wednesday if i remember rightly and those recording sessions went on for a grand total of two sessions after that none of us ever went back and he never brought up the topic and so and i'm sure we've lost those recordings also so i my uh, idea about mutaya's background is generally what he has given us in various media and what was published during his lifetime and immediately after of course i have had the privilege of knowing this family very well over the years so he came from this very very aristocratic chettiar family which was very well to do in colombo and and from what he told me had business interests going all the way up to french indochina and then uh, so they were he in particular being the eldest child had the best of everything uh, meeting up with uh, all kinds of uh, sri lankan top ranking leaders greeting jawaharlal nehru with a bouquet when he arrived in colombo so many other things and uh, then he had the best of education so he was uh, admitted to the best school in sri lanka and then from there he went on to uh, yercod and from there he went on to the lawrence school in mari and finally decided to go to the united states to do engineering having gone there he decided that journalism was his calling and decided to focus on humanities then did a masters in international relations and came back to work in colombo and uh, joined the times of ceylon uh, but then you know his father had already had a change of heart and had decided to settle in india mr mutaya was caught up in all kinds of citizenship issues he did not like the idea of taking or being forced to become a sri lankan citizen and so when he was 38 he decided to come back to india and uh, as he always said he married a lady a, a woman who was far Ah, younger to him, his family had by then almost given up the idea of his getting married, but he did marry Valli. And in my opinion, and in the opinion of Mr. Mutaya and several others, she was really the making of Mr. Mutaya. Uh, you know, in uh, in this Tyagaraja Kriti, Tyagaraja says, "Rama, what, you would have been nothing had you not married our Sita." So I am very, uh, I can say the same thing very confidently that Mr. Mutaya would not have amounted to being Mr. Mutaya had Valliyamal Mutaya not been his partner, his equal, his sternest critic, and she refused to hero worship him till the last day of her life. And uh, she, of course, it's not that she tried to dominate him or anything. She was very proud of all that he did. She was exceedingly supportive of everything that he did. but at the same time mr mutaya had to know his place in the pecking order in the household and um, i got to know that wonderful lady also very very well and so uh, it is with great with warm memories that i think of her at this moment when mr captain said that i'm sure mr mutaya must be smiling from up there mrs mutaya must also be smiling from up there 
because it always gave her great joy to participate in any event where her husband had a certain role to play. And so he married her, then they had the two lovely daughters, Dolly and Chuti. He uh, told me that when he came here, he wanted to get into journalism, but their jobs were not really available. He finally decided to join TT Maps and uh, he rose to become the top man in uh, TT Maps. He worked very hard at it, he told me, and that is where he, apart from his journalistic beginnings, where he knew all about print and page layouts and whatever was being used in newspaper, working in TT Maps helped him to further hone that skill. And uh, there was a certain facet of his life which I just did not know, which was he was very actively involved in a printer's association in South India, or whether it was the whole of India, I have no idea. But he was looked up to as some kind of god by the printers. And uh, all the time, whenever, uh, several times when I have been to his house, I would find that there were some men with dreams of paper and representing the amalgamated printers and other associations. And, you know, they would all come to him and bow before him in the altar and take his blessings. And Mr. Muthaya would say a couple of words in benediction and they would walk away feeling very blessed and delighted because he, he had an exalted status in the world of printing. And uh, he hero worshipped Bartholomew Ziegenbal, the German padre who came here in 1707 and set about a revolution in Indian printing. And when his, the, um, when it was, I think, 300 years of Ziegenbal coming to India came about, Mr. Mutaya was in the forefront of those celebrations, working with the German mission at Halle and with the Roja Mutaya Research Library. To him, Tranke Bar became almost a pilgrimage spot because he loved going there, particularly to visit the house where Zigan Balg lived and where he set about creating that first printing press. And later, when I took an interest in Tranke Bar, he would always ask me, and how is that bungalow? Is that house still there? Are they taking care of it? Is that printing machinery there? And he became very happy when he got to know that there was a German lady who had decided to run a museum in that place. And he always wanted to go back there and see it, but I don't think he could ever make that journey. Now, he worked in TT Maps, and from what little he told me, he said that he was very uh, caught up in making atlases and maps. But there was a, some kind of a, you know, in those days, Government of India had a rule and a regulation for practically everything, including when we could go to the restrooms. I think they even regulated that. So, there was some Something regarding taxation where if you brought out a map, it suffered tax. Whereas if you brought out the map as a booklet with information, this was without tax. And so Mutaya decided that that is how TT Maps products could be sold. And he set about writing informatory notes about the map that was accompanying the booklet. So in effect, the map became an adjunct to a book. Which, and that is how he greatly developed an interest in the history of South India, the history of Chennai, and it became a great uh, research factor in his life. Uh, years later, during the course of a very uh, hilarious lunch, Mrs. Muthaya told me that when he was uh, in TT Maps, she took his horoscope to an astrologer or she went to meet an astrologer. I, those memories are a little vague now. And he told her that your husband's best years are after he retires from his career. He will turn 60 and then there will be a completely new activity in his life. And that will put him on the map and he will become exceedingly successful and famous. He, of course, smiled when she told, told me this and he said, don't believe all that. But she was quite emphatic about that story. Strangely enough, that is exactly what happened because uh, he, around the time that he was retiring, he came out with this book called Madras Discovered, a historical guide to looking around, supplemented with tales of Once Upon a City, which is a, another book that he wrote and then finally the two of them would get amalgamated. But uh, this book became a bestseller and it has, I think, right, if I'm not mistaken, he lived to see the ninth edition of this book coming out. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the first book, I think, was certainly not more than 100 pages. But thereafter, finally, the last edition of uh, Madras Rediscovered 
was, if I am not mistaken, 468 pages with a very, very comprehensive index. And he ensured that it was up to date with the latest information. Uh, it, of course, resulted in a ruckus with a political uh, leader of, of whom I will talk about towards the end of my presentation. But the book still remains a bestseller and has continued to remain in print ever since. If you ask me what was his warmest memory, it was writing in this magazine called Aside. He would keep talking about it all the time. Aside was a magazine that was brought out by Abraham Irali. And uh, I have seen just a couple of issues of it. And according to him, there was a time when everybody who was, uh, you know, who took to writing in Madras wrote for Aside. So uh, I think Randor Guy wrote for it. Mr. Mutaya wrote for it. Uh, Gita Doctor wrote for it. There were several people, uh, Janaki, who was, uh, if you ask me, if, if you ask Mr. Mutaya of who he thought was the finest journalist that he knew, he would always talk about Janaki. And uh, he, for a long time, I remember he was not in touch with his lady and he kept wondering where she had gone. And finally, he was able to re-establish contact with her. She did write a couple of stories for Madras Musings much later. But uh, Aside was really the magazine that he kept going back to. And he told me that there has never been another magazine like Aside in the history of this city. And sadly enough, it folded up and uh, it remains a mere memory uh, today. When it comes to the writing of history, Mr. Mutaya very readily acknowledged that he was certainly not the first to write the story of Madras. And uh, to him, the three volumes of H.D. Love, along with the index, which is a fourth volume, written in 1913, always remained the greatest reference book uh, as far as the history of the city was concerned. He did not think much about Tall Boy Wheeler's book, Madras in the Olden Time, which predated Love's Vestiges of Old Madras. And he also always acknowledged that N.S. Ramaswamy wrote on the history of the city before he did. Ramaswamy was, um, according to Mr. Mutaya, a really good historian. And uh, he was working for the Ind Indian Express. And... Uh, According to him, he was not a very easy personality to get along with, not very communicative, but he knew his stuff and uh, he used to uh, write very well on the history of the city. Many uh, years later, when Mr. Mutaya handed over certain papers to me, I, I discovered very neatly pasted newspaper clippings of Ramaswamy's articles in that collection. And I still have a few of them. Uh, whatever he gave me, I still have with me. Ramaswamy and Mutaya would co will work. Actually, Ramaswamy was asked to do a book on Paris 200 when that company completed 200 years, which was in 1988. And he passed away during the time of the book. And Mr. Mutaya was asked to step in and complete the book, which is why I have scanned the founding of Madras, which you see on the left side of the slide is a book that Ramaswamy wrote himself. The back leaf that I have scanned on the right side of the slide is from the back page of Paris 200, which is this book which I have with me over here. And on the back flap, you have a profile of, Ms. of N.S. Ramaswamy as well as S. Mutaya. And you can see the magnanimity of Mr. Mutaya that he allowed for the photograph of Ramaswamy to come on the back cover, but he didn't, allow, he didn't even think of asking for his photograph to be put on that particular cover. Uh, it remains the first corporate biography, as far as I know, that Mr. Mutaya wrote. In 1991, he became very involved with uh, Madras Musings. He started Madras Musings. I shouldn't say he became involved. He started Madras Musings. As I told you, he was very close to the printing world. And uh, there was, again, a government regulation, apparently, where if a printing press brought out a newspaper or a publication or a fortnightly, it had certain tax rebates in importing machinery. And so Lokavani, whose owner, Varghese, was a very close friend of Mr. Mutayas, they had a conversation and they decided that they would bring out a magazine called Madras Musings, a fortnightly, in 1991. And Lokavani imported a printing press on that basis. 
So uh, Madras Musings thereafter got into print and uh, it, uh, it was what aside was at one point of time. It, it chose to use roughly the same set of writers, uh, the same uh, you know, kind of articles. There was a recipe or two. There was a story about uh, some historical aspect of the city. There was a column from the man of Madras Musings, man from Madras Musings who has had a singularly long run with that magazine. And uh, then there was Geeta Doctor, Chandra Padmanabhan writing a set of recipes. I think Gautam Padmanabhan wrote the first quizzes that began coming out. There were sports articles by V. Ramnarayan, and that's how it started. Musings would have folded up uh, in the sense that uh, it was initially, as uh, from what Mr. Mutaya told me, he said that initially they thought that they would compete, they, didn't, they never wanted to compete with uh, the Hindu or papers like that. They didn't have a hope of competing like that. But they wanted to bring it out as a fortnightly and they were looking for advertising revenue. And that was not going to happen because uh, they found that advertising revenue was just not coming in. They looked at donations from subscribers, that again was very small in number. And then sometime in the first uh, five years of the magazine coming out, Mr. Mutaya wrote an editorial saying that Musings has run, has Musings run its race. This was, I think, sometime in 94 or 95 because I was back in Chennai at that time and I distinctly remember reading that particular issue of Madras Musings. Whereupon he got a call from Mr. N. Shankar of the Sanmar Group who said that if you can keep the magazine running for a couple of issues more, I'll put together well, I'll see what I can do. So they had a meeting and then Mr. Shankar told him that uh, he would do something about it. So Mr. Mutaya kept the issue going. Shankar, in the meantime, got together a set of industrialists of the city. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first issue after the revival had 12 sponsors. And he asked all of them to make a donation every year and a commitment that they would keep that donation going towards Madras Musings from then on. And so they formed a not-for-profit company called Chennai Heritage. And uh, that is how uh, Madras Musings got a new lease of life. And it has remained going ever since. And uh, this was sometime, if I think it was in 1994, 1995. And uh, the number of sponsors has only gone up since then, as has the circulation. And uh, the magazine, when Mr. Mutaya passed away, was on a very, very strong wicket and it continues to remain that way. Long may it continue. To him, it was his third child. And uh, I must mention over here that uh, towards right at the end of his life on a particular day when he was very ill and he was not feeling very positive uh, and I had gone to visit him, he held my hand and he said, whatever happens, don't allow Madras Musings to close. And I promised him that I would keep it running. So that was the only thing, instruction that he had. That was the only thought that was on his mind. And, uh, you know, so to him, Madras Musings was very, very special. Now, the Madras Musings may have uh, given him a lot of uh, satisfaction by way of bringing out a journal of his own. But what really put him on the map was a column called Madras Miscellany, which began in the Hindu shortly after... Madras Musings began coming out. And that was thanks to Nirmala Lakshman and Mr. Mutaya discussing the matter together. He had taken classes on journalism at the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan uh, sometime earlier and several people came out of that stable and Nirmala was also one of his students. And it was she who suggested the name Madras Miscellany for the column. And Mr. Mutaya began writing for it every Monday. And... Uh, he, of course, made, you know, that story of him and that Olivetti typewriter that you see over there. Every once in a while, it would make it up, its appearance in the column and, you know, the public would know that he was not using a computer to bring out his stories. He was actually typewriting his stories. And I can vouch for it because in 1999, 2000, when I really got to know him well, I needed some material from him and he said, his, he, he, said he would write it. And his handwriting was so bad that I couldn't make out head or tail out of it. Then I told him, look, I'll type it. Why don't you just dictate it to me? He said, no, I'll type it for you. And then I couldn't believe my eyes came two sheets of paper typewritten on this Olivetti. So he was actually using two fingers and going tuck, 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 
and he was bringing up his stories. So the initial stories of the Madras Miscellany were actually typed on this, or for a long time, they were typed on this Olivetti. And while bringing out new things would not give him much stress in the sense that he wouldn't be bothered. He knew that there was a sufficient set of people who were willing to write. So there were costs. There was backlog material available. He had to just put together this and that together and so on. Miss Miscellany would get him all stressed and worked up. Especially if he was going abroad to be with his children for five weeks or six weeks. He would tell me, I need to put five stories together. I need to put six stories together. There are six Mondays between the time I am leaving and I am coming back. So that means 2,500 words for every issue. Multiply that by six. Appa. That he, would, he would always refer to everybody as Appa. So now, Appa, I need to write so many words now. I've got to type it out. I need ideas. So I'm going to think about it. This, that. He get really worked, about, uh, worked up about Madras miscellany. So once I made this singular mistake of telling him, all journalists take a holiday. So when you go abroad, who's asking you to continue that column? Why don't you take a break on it? He just gazed at me for five minutes without saying a single word. And then after that, we began to discuss some other topic. I could see that I had really riled up the old man by suggesting that he take a holiday from Madras Miscellany. There was no question of taking any holiday for him. So Miscellany has, I mean, it lasted till the day he passed away, frankly. And uh, he uh, finally compiled one set of articles sometime in 2010 or 2011. And he brought it out as a Madras miscellany, a decade of people, places, and folk uh, designed by Malvika Mera and edited by Rukmini Amirapu. And it remains a wonderful reference volume till date. Uh, for anything that you know, need to know because of its outstanding index, particularly, I'll just get you the book if you'll just be fair with me. Ah, I know where it is. Let's see. So that is the thickness of the book, and that is the book itself. So this remains one of the uh, reference volumes of for the city. And after H. D. Love's Vestiges of Old Madras is probably one of the most comprehensive volumes that anybody could have written on this particular, on Madras city. The wonder about Madras miscellany was that over a period of time, it ceased to be a solely Muthaya work and it became a hugely collaborative exercise. The collaborators being the readers of the Hindu. So they began sending him material, asking him questions, giving him suggestions. Of course, the responsibility of giving answers to all those queries it's not as though they were coming up with the articles themselves. They would just gently drop a hint or two. They would write him letters. They would say, you know, do you know something about this building? I happen to pass this way. And he would then research it and he would then write it as an article. And he would acknowledge every one of those people in the columns. People were just delighted to see their names in the press. So when the postman knocked, which I, I discovered was a fairly naughty game that people used to play at one point of time. So when the postman knocked was a very important section of the Madras miscellany column, which had readers' contributions and readers' queries. Sometimes an entire issue of Madras miscellany would be dedicated to when the postman knocked. And so that was the volume of the correspondence that this particular, uh, you know, column generated, it created a huge amount of interest in the history of the city. And uh, it was only the personality of Mr. Mutaya and his hard work that kept it going for so long. Now, where did he find his reference material? He had a huge collection of books of which only he knew where every book was. None of us could have ever found out what was where in that collection. And uh, the, you know, like a Mughal emperor, only the chosen few would be allowed admittance into this room where the collection of books was kept. So the Divane Arm or the Hall of Public Audience was the drawing room of the house where everybody was met up with, given coffee, tea, more. They discussed matters and then they were dismissed. But the very chosen few were taken up to the Divane Khas, 
which was on the second floor of the house where you had this collection of books where you had his prized collection of maps his newspaper notes his typewriter and this is where he spent quality time doing his research and he was meticulous as far as his research was concerned actually much of the research had been done in the 20 years that he had uh, been working with tt maps and lot of the information was in his head but he also went ahead and he never stopped looking at books of reference making sure that he had got his dates correctly and the other great thing about him was if a reader pointed out an error in something that he had written he would graciously acknowledge that reader and say that so and so pointed this out to me i stand corrected and now i am publishing the version that so and so has said so it gave lots of people a great ego boost to find that their names were not only acknowledged but their their, their corrections of what mr mutaya had written had also been acknowledged this man had no ego he was a researcher till the end he was collecting information putting it together accepting facts from other people so this was his greatness this collection uh, a substantial part of it finally went to the roja mutaya research library where it now is and is available for researchers uh, he as i said he began writing books uh, in tt maps itself but his the publications that would carry his name began coming out from 1988 or 1987 1988 onwards and they continued right till the time that he passed away uh, when he, uh, he when we asked him when, when we when those of us who knew him well would ask him about how many books he had written he would say around 40 but he had long ceased keeping track of the number of books that he had brought out when he passed away some of us got together and we made a compilation and we did come to a sum total of 40 books uh, which considering the fact that the work had actually begun in 1988 and it ceased in 2019 is a remarkable very copious output and given the fact that the writer concerned was quite elderly and by the time you know he was taking up these books that's the kind of age when most men or women would think of retiring and here he was bringing out books with a great passion so there were books of all kinds so there was a for instance there were books on the english language which he had written very early and then which were reprinted later there were books on communities like the anglo indians and of course the chetia community from which he came uh, one of the best books was uh, the chetiar heritage i have never seen a finer book on chetiars the one that he wrote along with his sister uh, meenakshi mayapen and with vishalakshi ramaswamy uh, it's a great reference volume and much later he would bring out a chetiar album which he did with his nephew uh, mayapen and it is it, which is a collection of uh, photographs of the chetiar community on Madras, of course, there were any number of books. Madras, The Gracious City, Madras, The Past and Present, uh, Madras Rediscovered, of course, which kept coming out continuously. Uh, Madras, uh, so many other books. Madras, The Gateway to the Coromandel. Then he also did some very interesting books on personalities. Lieutenant General Inder Singh Gill uh, was the subject of a, a biography. T.T. Vasu was the subject of a biography. Ironically, two biographies, I mean, biographies of two Chetiyars, people of his own community, never came out in his name because he had differences of opinion with the people who commissioned him to do it. The first one was the biography of MCT Chidambaram Chetiyar, which has the title An Unfinished Journey. And that came out uh, without Mr. Muthaya's uh, name on it. And the other one was, a, I know that he worked very hard on it, but it came out finally as a very truncated volume, which was his biography of Aragapa Chetia, the philanthropist who set up several, you know, college educational institutions. That book was finally brought out in someone else's name as a very truncated volume. He, of course, uh, did a lot of books on institutions. So, you know, Konemara, the, uh, then uh, the Madras Club, the Madras Cricket Club, the Kodai Canal Club, the Madras Boat Club. And uh, he also did uh, several books on corporate bodies. So Paris, uh, then the uh, biography of A.M.M. Arunachalam is as, looking back from Mulmeen, is as much a biography of that man as it is a biography of the Murugappa group. He did a book on Ashok Leyland, on Spencer's, 
several books. So actually around 40 books came out of him and all of them are wonderfully written, eminently readable uh, volumes. It just goes to show how hard he worked on them. He always had research assistants and people who worked with him on bringing out these books. He very handsomely acknowledged each one of them when he produced a work. So there was V. Ram Narayan, Sashi Nair, Ranjita Ashok. Uh, I uh, did help him on a couple of books, uh, but the, I was not involved with most of what he was doing in terms of uh, books. And so he would acknowledge all these people when he uh, brought out the book and he would give them a considerable amount of credit. He was that way uh, exceedingly generous. But one of the biggest contributions of Mr. Mutaya was making Chennai aware of its heritage. Uh, in fact, he beat no, he made no bones about it when he said that when he took to writing and bringing out Madras Musings and Madras Miscellany, there was not a single word about the heritage buildings of the city in the daily press or the periodicals or the publications of that time. They had all been forgotten. So this was sometime in the early 1990s. And he said that heritage of the city had reached a certain tipping point when real estate was all that mattered and these buildings were all going to be demolished and done away with. The demolition of Bentings building, the setting fire to of Moore Market, uh, the setting fire to or the let's say, you know, I shouldn't say setting fire to, I suppose. Uh, all these buildings, you know, mysteriously burnt. It's as though on one particular day, day, they decided tomorrow morning we should be a pile of ashes. And so Spencer's went up in flames. So, you know, several of these buildings were going. And Mr. Muttaya single-handedly began getting Chennai to become proud of its heritage. And if he started this in 1990 or 1991, by the time he passed away in 2019, you had to just look at the transformation. All newspapers had columns on heritage. And it was not just the English newspapers. The Tamil newspapers were carrying columns on heritage as well. The media was dedicating time to, uh, to Chennai's heritage. Social media was waxing eloquent on Chennai heritage. So there was so much of activity. I would say that he was the man who gave it a definition and a meaning. And to him, the Senate House was the symbol of all that was beautiful and gracious by way of architectural heritage in this city. And he worked very hard for the restoration of this Senate House. In fact, if you look at the single, if you look at one theme, running theme for a very long period of time in his articles, in musings, in miscellany, and everywhere else. He would keep talking about how the Senate House had been locked up, the domes were expanding and likely to crack, and there was water seepage, and the frescoes were getting lost, and therefore he was very keen that the Senate House should be restored. The opportunity came in 2005, and there was nobody more delighted than he when the Vice Chancellor, Mr. S. P. Dr. S. P. Tyagarajan, roped him in and formed a committee for the restoration of the Senate House. Mr. Mutaya wrote got together people from various walks of life to contribute to the Senate House's restoration. He organized for symposiums on the building, on its architecture and the history that went on inside it. And he got the Chennai Willingdon Foundation to, to donate a significant corpus of money for the restoration of the building. Together with what the public gave and what other corporate bodies gave, around 11 crores was collected for the restoration of the Senate House. Work began on the restoration and it was committed that when the Senate House was, would be restored and rededicated to the public, a committee would be formed to administer Senate House and make it available for public events. So this was a commitment given by the university in return for all the public uh, goodwill that the restoration had garnered. When the building was completed, Mr. Mutaya brought out this book, A Work of Genius, which I have, the cover of which I have put out over here. And then the inauguration happened by the President of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, came to rededicate the building to the nation. Next day, the Vice Chancellor retired. And when he was leaving, by way of farewell, a slipper was thrown at him. And thereafter, his successor locked up Senate House 
and it went back to becoming a repository for examination papers, which is what it had been before Mr. Muthaya started work on the restoration. He was a deeply disappointed man once that happened. And it kind of shook his faith in the system and he generally did not ever want to be a part of a government committee or work on any government restoration exercise thereafter. To him, it was, I think, one of the biggest blows that he had suffered and uh, he felt that it was a betrayal of trust and a betrayal of confidence, what happened at that time. I told you that he encouraged the number of us to write and I have put together a small collection out of that lot which became part of the Mutaya gang or the Mutaya band. Photograph later. Peter Amnara, and whom you see on the top left, Shobha Menon, who went on to be co founder of the NGO Nidal, which works on the rest uh, on protection of trees in this. Shobha Nidal articles on hospitals, on uh, museums. Very, very painstaking articles that she wrote. Mr. Karasaya, who came back after a successful career as a marine engineer and then took to writing. And Mr. Mutaya and he worked on a wonderful book on the Madra Port Trust. Anwar, who started off as a photographer and today is a respected uh, documentary filmmaker, a historian of the city who specializes in the Islamic heritage of the city. There is Sashin Ayat down below. And of course, you know, I put up my photograph as well because I'm as much a product of the Mutaya stable as everyone else is. All of us, you know, he put up with our moods and our tantrums. He never had any temper tantrums at any given point of time. But there were a few things that we came to dread as far as working with Mr. Mutaya was concerned. So if you told him that, do you know, sir, there was a one line reference in this book that I read about this particular building, the next thing would be, why don't you do a thousand word article on it? And that was it. And then you had to go and write thousand words about a one sentence that you had found in a book. So after some time, we decided we were not going to tell him anything like this because that would result in being asked to write a thousand word article. And this man never forgot that. You know, once he had told you over the phone, 15 days later, there'd be a reminder on the email. Sriram, what about that article on that one sentence with a thousand words and underneath one warmest regards Muttu and you generally gritted your teeth and you know decided to get on with that piece of work. All of us were put through this mill of asking, you know, telling us to be told to write about all kinds of obscure things. And then there was this habit of his of going through the articles with one green fountain pen and a blue fountain pen. And all of them would be duly printed out and given to him by Pushpa, who was his secretary. And uh, he would first remove all the adjectives and all the uh, whatever comes before an adjective. So, you know, very, very good would become good. Uh, exceedingly beautiful would become beautiful. And then he would show us and say, see, 250 words have been cut out of your 500 word article. So it's exactly half the size now. Stop writing all these superlative words in this article. So we learned that. Then the second, third thing was we could never say one felt that one had to go there. He said that was the height of egoism if you wrote of yourself as oneself, etc. You write, you felt that you had to go there. You don't write one felt that one. Felt. See, he had all these uh, pet notions about how we had to write. And uh, numbers 1 to 10 had to be written in words. Whereas numbers 10, 11 onwards could be written as numeral. And then percent could never appear as a symbol. It has to be PER, then space, and then percent. And uh, if there was a four digit numeral, it had to have a comma after the first digit. Otherwise, how do I know the difference between the year and the number? If you write 1960, I can assume that it is the year 1960, isn't it? So these were all these pet things that we all learned how to write as per the specifications of the chief. And uh, he would then carry Captain, is that your alarm bell or something? No, anyway. Uh, anyway, I think it's, somebody is unmuted themselves and there is an echo. 
So the books, as I said, kept coming out and Madras Rediscovered, you know, had several editions. Towards the end, he compiled several of his stories and brought out a new volume for the 375th year of the city. 38 stories, each story for one decade of the city. Remarkable. So the first decade had a story pertaining to the first decade. Second decade had a story pertaining to itself. The 375th year had a story pertaining to the 37th decade of the city or the latest. So that's how he had structured this book. Now, this typewriter business of his, you know, the, you know, the fact that he typed out everything and that he, he always claimed that he was a computer ignoramus, ignoramus and all that. But one day I discovered him like this and I took that photograph on my cell phone. And uh, he, you know, he was very happy that I was taking that photograph and he beamed and he posed for me and I found that he was very comfortably using the mouse. So I asked him, what is all this? Because I thought you never knew how to use a computer. Apparently, his wife had told him that when we go abroad and all that, nobody is going to be typing anything out for you. So you better learn the basics of how to operate a computer. So when you switched on everything for him, he knew that it was a typewriter and he could continue typing on it. Towards the end of his life, his daughters gave him a cell phone as well. And so that cell phone would remain in his pocket. It was used only for one purpose. And that was for calling the driver after he had had his evening walk at the Madras club. So he would come out and stand peering into the darkness in the veranda. And any of us who was passing by, he would hand over the cell phone to us and say, call my driver with it. So we would actually make the call and summon the driver. I have never heard that phone ring and I have never seen him using the phone for anything else. So he was a man who was comfortably out of touch with technology. And when you ribbed him about it, he always said that social media was a lot of waste of time. As long as he was away from it, he could focus on what he was doing. His whole life was one of focus. And I must mention here about how hard he worked. So a typical Mutaya day began a little late. So, you know, it would begin at around 8 o'clock or so in the morning. And uh, so he would say, don't call me at 7 o'clock and generally tell me things because I'm not at my best at that time. So at around 8 o'clock, he would have his coffee or whatever. Then he would go through the papers, have his breakfast. And then by around 11, the work would begin. He never took a nap in the afternoon. Never. Even when he wanted to take a break, he would go up and read a book during the time that he was taking a break. Then in the afternoon, he would continue working after lunch. In the evening, it was always socializing. So he had a social calendar that would have given Barbara Hutton some jealousy of some kind. You know? So he would know every day he would have three events, like one in the afternoon, one in the late evening, one late at night. He would be the life and soul of every one of them, as Gita Doctor would say. He knew exactly how to kiss all the ladies without making any lip contact on their cheeks. And you would get a whiff of his aftershave lotion as he flitted by. Muthu was a great socializer. And all the women loved Mr. Muthaya. As, Alia, as Mrs. Muthaya would say, Ayya or a girlfriend, Zella on the Tanga. So, you know, they would all be there of various age groups. The oldest one was Olive Paul, who was more than 100. And then... Or oh, downwards still, you know, you had my wife and several others who would all go and embrace him, call him uncle and stuff like that. So many years later, one day he told me, you know, Sharda, she calls me uncle. Why don't you call me uncle? I said, look, we have all, I have always called you sir and I am going to call you that only no uncle business over here. So he said, okay, let it be. <laughs> so that was it. But, Hi there, girl, girly. What's happening to you now? This, that, and sundry, and he would make conversations with all of them. Oh, he was a great socialite. And uh, if he didn't have somewhere to go to, he used to get very bored. And uh, I remember uh, uh, three of us, uh, actually three of my friends and I, we used to meet every Thursday at the Madras Club. And uh, one day he told me, you know, I don't have anything to do. I plan to join your group. And I knew that he would be very out of place in that group. So it took all my tact to tell him that, look, you know, uh, that and Thandri and generally fobbed him off that whole thing. But he really enjoyed meeting people. Though he was not an introvert under any circumstance. He loved being with people all the time. So every event, you see him here, 
he's talking on the mic, he's reminiscing, he would despite this, he would work all the time. You know, he would spend quality time when he went out for events. He would work continuously. He worked very hard. And lastly, he never missed his sports events. So if there were football matches going on, World Cup happening, he would remain awake the whole night watching all the matches. He was a huge sports enthusiast. He loved cricket. He loved hockey. He loved football. He loved tennis. Every one of the games he watched. And he had all the facts at his fingertips, starting from the year that he started researching, which must have been like 1850 or some such thing, till the latest he knew who was what, which sportsman was seeded where. He knew everything about sports. Sports was actually his first love. And it is very interesting that when he died, he was actually working on a book on the sports of Tamil Nadu. And his daughter, uh, Chuti, that is uh, Parvati, would actually complete it and bring it out. I mentioned to you about Mr. Mutaya's uh, run-in with a politician. And I must say that it is very disappointing that for a man who did so much to bring to light the history of the city, he didn't get any recognition of any kind from the government. Never. Uh, they were just not bothered about what Mr. Muthaya was doing. He, on the other hand, received a member of the British Empire recognition from the Queen. But when it came to the kind of people today who get Padma Shri's and Padma Bhushan's and Padma Vibhushan's and the Kalai Mamani and things like that, it is very strange and very disheartening that a man of his contribution and his erudition and his stature and his selfless work that he did on heritage never got any award. And he was not really concerned about it either. But it did bother several people. And I know that Vikram Raghavan, who is a lawyer in Washington, D.C., actually put together a proposal to be sent to the government that, you know, Mr. Muthaya should be recognized with one of the Padma Awards. Nothing really came out of it. But on the other hand, though they may not have recognized him for an award, it is very interesting to note that chief ministers very carefully read his Madras Rediscovered to find out where they were mentioned in that book. I'm sure they must have gone and looked at the index first to see if their name was there. Then they must have gone to see the index to see if their enemies' names were there. Then they must have gone to the individual pages to see how many lines Mr. Mutaya had dedicated to them, how many lines had been dedicated to their enemy. So one chief minister took particular umbrage at the fact that Mr. Mutaya had mentioned him a little less than what he had mentioned his rival and counterpart. And so he made a comment at a book launch saying that it is ironic that Mr. Mutaya has not mentioned me at all. And so that did not exactly endear him to one set of party functionaries. Not that the other party had any great love for Mr. Mutaya. They, like all heritage activists, perhaps they viewed him as a nuisance and uh, who was, you know, in their way of destroying heritage buildings. So that is, you know, that, that's very strange that the government should have ignored him. The other set of detractors, and here I am putting up a photograph of him with members of the Roja Mutaya Research Library, an institution that he was exceedingly fond of and he was on its trust board. And he worked very hard for you know, uh, keeping it uh, going and it still remains a center of excellence. He's with Theodore Baskaran over here who also served on the same trust. A lot of people used to say that Mr. Muthaya's version of history is very anglicized and he looks only at Western sources. He doesn't look at Indian sources and stuff like that. He was the first person to acknowledge it. When you approached him and told him that this is what people say, he'd say yes, because that is what I know. I don't know how to read Tamil. If those people know how to read Tamil, why don't they write an alternative history? Nobody is preventing them from writing something like that. I am writing what I know. If they disagree with me, let them come up with writing something else. And he, he, they, nobody ever did. That's a very funny thing. You know, they all would criticize him behind their back, behind his back. But when they met him, they would be obsequiousness personified. They would, you know, bend down and say, And then afterwards, they would go and say, So, you know, he, he knew everything that was going on. But he remained true to what he felt he was comfortable with. That was the greatness of the man. I must, before I finish, I will mention two other things that he was very fond of. One was the Madras Book Club. 
the book club was once a month and very often twice a month its heyday was when it was meeting in the konimara and mr muthaya and k s padmanabhan would be the two live wires of the thing he would always begin the book club meetings with one standard introduction we began in the publisher canteens of publishers and if you don't pay of membership dues we will end up in the canteen of publishers we cannot afford to be in the konimara anymore the book club is one of those wonderful he would say the book club is one of those wonderful organizations where we don't have any office bearers no president no vice president no premises of our own it's only very recently that we started maintaining accounts and then he would say those of you who have not paid your membership dues jayanti he would always pronounce jayanti in a very sri lankan fashion jayanti who is sitting in that corner there she will take your money from you and he would always mess up the membership dues and then he would say it's 2000 and somebody from the audience would say oh no it's 1800 1800 he said ah 1800 yes yes it's 1800 he would always correct himself so this man did not have great idea about money and as long as things were going fine in these institutions he was quite happy with that the other was madras state uh, sometime in the uh, early 2000s if i am not mistaken uh, vincent disuza and sashi nair got mr muthaya to collaborate with them on starting off the madras day celebrations he uh, always made it very clear that the records do not mention august 22nd as the birthday of the city the, there is a lot of confusion the document is dated july love himself says that instead of july probably the writer meant august but they wrote it by error as july when the grant was given so there is confusion but mr muthaya felt that a day to celebrate the city is a good thing that is how he got into the whole thing later of course people made it out into the birthplace of birthday of madras and stuff like that and he went along with it because he did not think it entirely wrong because we don't know when it really happened it was sometime in the months of july and august 1639 and uh, once again there would be critics who would say that this is the founding of the colonial city he would say okay then write about the non colonial city write about what happened earlier nobody is preventing you from doing it and some of them wrote highly fanciful articles about how madras was a city of palaces before the british came and how there were all kinds of things and he would say please cite your sources which is the inscription that says that this was a sprawling straggling metropolis before the arrival of the british if it is there in any inscription i'd be happy to know of where that is and nobody has ever furnished any information yes we do know that several of the villages were very historic entities long before the creation of madras there is no doubt about that but the colonial city of madras which is what gives us this identity today really did begin in 1639 under mr muthaya's leadership madras day became madras week madras week became madras month beginning in june he would have a meeting with all the contributors and we would be asked to put together our ideas then he would write letters to all the consulates all the embassies all the hotels all the corporate bodies that he knew and he would get them all to participate in madras week celebration in some years there were as many as 400 or 500 events to come to celebrate the city and there was extensive media coverage i am sure he must have been heartbroken when he got to know that i did not have a madras week on behalf of madras musings this year but you know circumstances were unusual and we decided to take that call so towards the end of his life there was a lot of celebration this photograph was taken when konimara baked a cake in the shape of the celebration then there was that happy day when they celebrated 40 years of marriage mr and mrs muthaya she he had turned 80 she was 60 and they had completed 40 years of marriage the cake that was baked exactly like this is what you see over here before mrs muthaya is going to uh it would have been a taken let them remain like this for the rest of their lives sad it was not to be a couple of years or just a year after this event was over mrs muthaya died very suddenly 
and uh, he was a heartbroken man thereafter though he was a man of slip and he kept going he attended all the events in fact the next column of madras miscellany came out without break after her passing away with a dedication to her at the top which said dear i know that you have wanted to you would have wanted me to go on with it the way i was doing all along and so he continued bringing out you know the madras miscellany column uh, in the madras musings of course and he worked very hard for the remaining years of his life uh, he would have taught he also taught his illness a thing or two he knew how to keep it under control and manage everything in his life as though there was no change he still went out he still wrote books he still worked very hard but then ultimately you know then there was the silver jubilee of madras musings which was an event that gave him a lot of happiness in 2016 we brought out a commemorative volume of madras musings uh, comprising some of the best articles that had come out in it over several years and uh, he was the life and soul of this particular event but then the human body is not a permanent one and though he would have loved to have gone on for a very long would have gone on forever writing books and things like that there did come a time when mr mutaya had to pass away leaving all of us with fond memories of this wonderful man there is not a day when i don't think about him i keep a framed photograph of his on my table and uh, when i sit down to write he keeps watch over me and make sure that i continue working the way he would have liked me between us there was a wonderful working relationship and uh, uh words fail me uh, in the sense that uh, it was i don't know i mean i i, I can't say anything further so uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me an opportunity uh, as i say this i can see him smiling from the opposite side from the photograph and i'm sure he's telling me don't be an ass or don't make an ass of yourself now conclude it while the going is good and therefore <laughs> i shall conclude over here thank you very much yeah um we being a memorial lecture we do not have a question and answer session or something would you uh, uh, parvati would you like to uh, say some a few words uh thank you captain can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay hello everyone and thanks captain and thanks shriram for um, that wonderful um session with memories of um my dad um i think you knew more about him than we did so um yeah i think that says something um and i'm so happy over the last um especially this month because of madras week and madras month there's been a lot of people remembering him uh, and i'm sure it's every day but also this particular month a lot of people have been remembering him and it's heartwarming to see that he would have been very happy one of his i mean his uh, some of his last words were i want people around me talking about things that matter to me um Shreya mentioned a few things uh, uh, which I wanted to comment on. Um, his love for his Olivetti and uh, his computer journeys or his technology journeys. Um, he he was talking about how stressed he would become because uh, Missilini was due um, when he was traveling to visit either my sister or myself. um it was not stressful just for him it was stressful for us as well because he was like chuti come and help me with this my document is lost and everybody would have to leave whatever they were doing to come and um, assist him to make sure you know the document was rescued um the other thing was my mother um both of them had a very practical relationship neither one idolized the other um they respected each other but it was not oh you're such a great person um in fact for a very long time in any of his um thank yous uh, either on speeches or in books he never mentioned uh, my mom and it took a few of his admirers to come up and say to him 
how can you never acknowledge Mrs. Mutia? So I think it was almost like in the late, uh, sorry, uh, mid 2000s that he started acknowledging my mother in his speeches for fear somebody else would pull him up on it. Um, of course, he couldn't do anything without my mother. Um, the other thing also, he was very disappointed that uh, neither of his daughters took um, an interest in his work, uh, either with writing or with heritage or history. Um, my mother had weaned us off the writing track. Uh, I'm sort of getting back into it at the moment, but she had weaned us off the writing track. Um, and of course, he always bowed down to whatever she said. So yeah, so he um, he let us do whatever we wanted with our careers. Um, the history part, we still don't have the gene. Um, but my daughter, who's actually stayed up, it's about 10.30 in the night. My daughter, who stayed up here, has actually got the, uh, the history gene. She seems to enjoy her history. Um, yeah. Um, so... Uh, I think that's about what I wanted to say. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to um, log in and listen to memories of um, dad. And thank you, Sriram, for that wonderful presentation. As I said, you knew him more than us about his uh, um, life in Madras than we did, because when his life in Madras really started, we had moved out of the country. So, you know, he was more in touch with all of you than he was with us. Um, he would remember dates um, that, uh, that were of historical significance, our birthdays and our anniversaries were another matter. So that was the man for you. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you. I don't know if my sister, my sister's on the call, so she may want to say a couple of things as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Baruli Ranjani. Uh, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I just I'd like to add a couple of things. Uh, it, it's great to have this, especially in like during uh, Madras week and Madras month. Um, we, we've been seeing a, a, a lot of daddy's proteges continuing his work on Madras week and Madras month. So that's that's great to see even in this COVID times with all the virtual uh, sessions that uh, people have been having. Um, we, we've seen notices from Sriram, Anwar, Shashi, and um, uh, so uh, thank you to everybody. And this this was a great session. Um, it looks like the attendance capped out at 100, uh, and there's a session on YouTube. So we're really pleased to see um, that people are, are still very interested in the things that he did, and he, he would be smiling from up there. Uh, and mommy would be smiling from up there as well. So thank you for organizing it, Captain, and Sriram, thank you for a um, wonderful uh, talk.